Hello, everybody. Hopefully, every, uh, you had a good break, and we are ready and re-energized to understand rethinking zero copy networking with Alex Markut. Um, we're going to play a video. This is pre-recorded. Ask your questions on the Q and A tab, and raise your hands if you have an emergency question and we can't wait. If not, hold the questions, the live questions, for the last fifteen minutes, and Alex will come back and address them. Enjoy. Hi, folks. My name is Alex. I'm coming from Vimur, and today I'm going to talk about mail and uh, zero copy networking. So uh, it's important to remember that this is a moonshot talk. So many other things that I will discuss are experimental and are for change. Right. So let's start at the beginning. When we're building an network facing application, there are essentially two choices. Either you use ubiquitous sockets, which is simple as importing a library, creating a socket, connecting to your destination, and setting your IO. And in these four lines, you get all the robust scan infrastructure of routing, address resolution, transfer protocols, and many other uh, features and, and tools, right? And on the other hand, you can hire a team of uh, highly skilled engineers to maintain a highly volatile camera bypass implementation and hope for the best. And the reason you're making this choice is because one solution is fast and the other one is slow. So the holy grail for uh, bridging the performance gap is zero copy. Because every I operation with sockets copies the data between the kernel and the application. And when the network speeds uh, go up to 100 gigabits per second or higher, you can spend about 70% of your CPU cycles on just moving bytes. So this is a problem. Additionally, this, all the shuffling of bytes also uh, hurts your performance in other ways because you're actually thrashing uh, cache lines. All this movement of bytes means that bytes that are used for, for, for your computation are actually maybe evicted because of copying. And when you have enough of this going around, you actually can hurt your memory controller and, you, and uh, hit the memory bandwidth limit. Uh, so copying is kind of bad when you have a lot of I have to do. So why do we actually copy with networking? Uh, not you know other uh, devices don't actually have a zero copy and it's simple. So the reason uh, the problem is that uh, the network packet arrival order is random in the sense that you don't know when the next packet is coming and where is it going, right? So hence the the, the receive flow is 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 this. So first the kernel provides memory for I/O, then the packet arrives, and then the data is copied to the correct uh, process. Well, uh, NVMEs and, and GPUs do it the following way. The process asks for IO to happen, provides its you know, huge buffer, and the data just, is just being made. Just as simple as that. So what are the challenges? How, how, what are the challenges we need to overcome in order to provide zero copy for networking? So it's, it's all about isolation. So you have to isolate the kernel memory from the user. The user you know, must not be allowed to access anything that the kernel is it's writing read, right? Similarly, you shouldn't allow the user to be able to modify the network headers by the packet stress and the network stack. So you have to make sure that only the data that is intended for a user is available to the user. Right? And thirdly, you must isolate one user from the other. So lots of challenges. And in the last 40 years, there were numerous attempts at uh, providing zero copy. And they kind of fall uh, into five categories. And the list that I will show is not in no, in no way complete. Uh, but let's start. So first, we have dynamic remapping, which includes uh, things like message zero copy and TCP MAP, which both of you, you you've seen here at NEDF in, in, in a couple of last years. Copy and write by FreeBSD, which I think is dead. And it implies uh, that you're modifying the page tables while in data path. Right? And so th this means that your copying is not, uh, so, so you, avoiding zero copy is not zero overhead. This is what we want to receive. And you know, TCP MAP implies that you need 4K MTU and, and other limitations. The other thing that people do is kernel bypass. So we get DPK, NetMap, AFXDP, and you kind of lose 
all the infrastructure that you that you kind of want to get. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. And people well, have to. You have limited use case uh, applications like Splice, SendFile, SockMail, many others. But the problem is that you can't really uh, build a generic application uh, by using these tools. Specialized hardware. RDMA is great as long as all of your uh, connectivity is end-to-end -end RDMA. Uh, and the last one is shared memory. And I actually am not familiar with any uh, good shared mem memory solution or one that is used anywhere. So obviously, the way to go is, is to do shared memory right. And what we and the idea is called memory segmentation, which means that you have pages that are I only. So one part of your memory is intended specifically for IO for one specific user. And this user and, and the, the associated kernel uh, device drivers, they use a mail, a memory allocator for IO. So how does this work? So a mail page will be used for IO. And when the packet arrives, uh, it's the DMA, and then it's the page uh, is delivered to the process. So now you ask, how does it help? How, how does it solve the isolation uh, problems that we discussed? So first of all, the kernel memory, which is kind of the big one. So because memory is segmented, right? No kernel, kernel data is ever located on IPH. Uh, and specifically, any byte that is on this, uh, is in this memory is by or for that user, right? So the, the kernel is safe. As a solution between process, this one, you actually do need hardware uh, optimization or a hardware solution. But the thing is that it's already here, right? We heard about Intel application dedicated queues last year, and we have NVIDIA Cupis, uh, and we had them for, for about 20 years or so, where you can create a queue pair or a ring for, for each application, right? So that's how DPDK bifurcator driver is implemented. And lastly, for virtual devices, virtual machines, you can implement this uh, functionality in, you know, in, in the parallel driver itself, and, and and so for any operating system for like ASXI, my, uh, Windows, and, and and obviously AQ. And on the control path on the network stack, you can also need hardware optimization by where you do scatter gather receive, where you, you know provide forty bytes in, in non mail buffer for the headers, and the rest of the payload goes to a mail buffer. Buffer and if you need to uh, copy bytes, you know you just copy one small chunk rather than the whole packet, the whole MTU, and this is insignificant. Uh, so where's the catch? The catch is that uh, the zero copy zero copy semantics are not copy semantics that we are used to, and we can see it in in, in list of all, following ways. So the buffers change ownership. When you transmit a packet, the kernel owns it now, and the user must not modify it. Otherwise, he can, uh, you know, uh, break the, uh, the the correctness of the stream that is sent. So, wrong bytes can can get the, to the other side. And the other problem is there's no serialization or linearization on the receive side, where usually you just provide a huge buffer and say, "Hey, please put all the data here." It could be you know 64k byte for you say. Put my information here in one contiguous uh, area. Here you need to handle a uh, scatter gather, gather of buffers where each buffer is limited by the size of, a, of the MTU, unless, of course, you have some hardware help. Now, with Mayo, we can, uh, th that's kind of the, the high overview now will deliver. Uh, with Mayo, you now replace this question with whether you use basic sockets or kernel buffers, now you can use mail sockets. And this this is the experimental API that we have. It's, it's up for change, as I mentioned. So with mail sockets, you need to create your huge page memory. We are using a huge pages. Uh, so we this this function maps your uh, does the M map and, and provides you with huge pages. And it does additional uh, kernel operation. We will dive into a specific API deeper and provides a cache. A cache is an opaque handler that uh, provides you with the mail allocation from user space, right? And we'll see how it's used. 
Next, we create and connect to our destination. It's it's a single uh, single call that does a lot of the a lot of things in different ways, it creates a TCP socket and etc. Right. So we create a kernel socket rather than a user space socket. And then for your I, you allocate from your cache a buffer. In this case, this is you allocate a 4K page buffer. Then you initialize your TCP ring. This is something that you usually don't see with sockets, uh, but we, we have seen that with IOU ring for NVMEs, it's, it was kind of popular. So uh, I think it's it's a good idea for us as well. And then you just send your buffer. You provide the index that you got when you create the socket, the buffer, its length, and then you can say whether or not you have more buffers coming coming in order to avoid uh, costly uh, system calls. So you can batch your IO. And then you can wait some, some time and check whether the buffer is, uh, if, you, if, if you can modify the buffer now or not. So let's look at the numbers. First, we'll, I'll show some evaluation uh, and, then, and some comparison that we did, and then we'll go into the implementation itself. So for this uh, test, it was a quick test we did. So we brought up two 60 core v VMs on, on GCP which gave us uh, 32 gigabits uh, on egress. Each had 64 gigabytes of memory, not that we use at all. And what we did, we created uh, 2K buffers of, six, of 16K. So it was about 32 megabytes, which was about the size of LLC. And we used it with one thread that we should, went, this, went over this array and sent it to the other side. So because you know copy operations and non-copy operations uh, usually reached different uh, networking utilization, what we're showing here is, is, is the number of cycles you spend on average per byte sent. So we took the idle uh, ticks from proc start and the network uh, uh, bytes that were sent and you know divided one by the other and got the result. So what we did here is we've compared iperf just as a sanity. We had our mail uh, implementation, had message zero copy, and even implementation with a simple socket doing send and send file just, just for comparison. And we see that uh, mail is you know kind of easily with our uh, proof of concept implementation was able to, to beat them all uh, faster only by 8% from message zero copy. I kind of uh, hope for more, but we will see how that we can probably improve. Now, uh, Looking at Perf, we see that do TCP send pages kind of does uh, is, is the most costly operation. Mail post takes TCP page is, is the kernel thread uh, function that you know, pulls the socket, uh, does a translation, and send it, sends the buffer. Uh, and the user kind of you know it doesn't do much. So when the queue is full, the uh, process is uh, sleeping, waiting for waiting for for pin from from the kernel. Message zero copy, we see that we get this get user pages fast and uh, some spin logs. And uh, there's a lot of uh, dealing with virtual uh, headers, and we, namely, the remapping is not cheap. Uh, and we see that CCP send message is actually the function itself is kind of cheap, but it's uh, presumably the theory is that it's faster than doing a Send page, uh, send page. Why? Because what I, what I failed to mention is that uh, in our initial implementation, we actually are even for 16k buffers, we are sending each each page separately. So we have an overhead per page rather than for buffer, and just in the optimization. A simple socket, kind of a simple story. Most of the cycles spent are just on moving bytes, and we're talking about not 100 gigabits. We're talking about uh, about you know, 20, 25 gigabits per second. Send file. So send file, uh, you have two system calls because you need to LC or open the files. In, in this case, we create 2,000 files instead of uh, buffers and LC to this, the beginning at the, when, we, when we started sending them. And we'll see a lot of uh, file system calls here. So that add to the overhead. So uh, send file is kind of nice, but you have the file system overhead as well. So the only thing that is truly over over free is, is mail. And now uh, this is kind of an interesting slide. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to. Um, oh, that's due to, due to send pages. Sorry for 
That's when we created 16 uh, processes doing the same thing. And what we were kind of uh, stunned to find out that message to co uh, copy, at least in our case, uh, failed to scale uh, and it failed to scale miserably because it was 10 times slower than mail. It was eating about 60, 50, 60% 60 of the whole CPU uh, of the 16 courses we're using eight cores uh, specifically on just sending those 29 gigabits per second. Looking at perfect, I, I wasn't able to, to, to pinpoint to something specific. It was all heavy. So in this case, uh, we see because we have more cores, we are we flashing the LLC more. Every, everyone, uh, every one of those example is heavier and costlier, but Mayo is still faster. And it's actually much faster. It's now 25% faster than the closest arrival, which is Senfa, right? Naive, for some example, for some reason, is a kind of faster than I expected, but it's close to hyper, so uh, probably need to do anything uh, too stupid in this experiment. I would love to know why what's happening with messages of copy, but kind of not the focus of my talk today. So now with now that I've shown you uh, how memory segmentation is great, what is it? Like, uh, how, 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 do you, how do you get it specifically? Well, you need obviously kind of support for it. And what this means that you have a memory cache for pages that are dedicated for one use case only, right? And on the other hand, you need to make sure and, and you allocate the pages from a dedicated allocator list. And what you need to make sure well, we, you know, you is one implementing members of this. We need to make sure that uh, the standard uh, memory management tools, or calls like get page and put page, uh, will return the buffer back back to you, back to your cache. It's important because you don't want to hunt down uh, each page and make sure that it's uh, separately and make sure that it's uh, where it's going, right? So by making sure that these core functions of, of that uh, worry about the reference counting and the ownership of the page uh, are aware of you. And that's kind of the whole magic, right? So uh, in, in, in case you know, some of you are not familiar with it, I'll talk about it uh, in clear detail. So each 4K page uh, in the system memory has struct page associated with it. It's 64 bytes of your of metadata and kind of a lot of stuff. It was somewhat democratized in, in recent years, but still hard to get. And the APIs, as I said, you need to get get and put page to work to comply with your memory segmentation. Compound head also uh, needs to comply with your, uh, your segmentation. Compound head means that, uh, for example, two megabyte huge pages are compound uh, pages. Well, compound page is just an array uh, of struct pages, right? Uh, in this case of two megabytes, you have an array of 512 struct pages. And there is a, a lot of metadata that you can hide in this array. And what we do have to uh, make sure that page ref ink is not used indiscriminately uh, as it does in, in many cases. So which, the problem with page ref ink, it increments the specific Pages reference cover rather than compound head, right? So your reference coming may, may go bad. So this is this is, should not be allowed to be used indiscriminately. Uh, so what? Well, how difficult is this? so? Why would we add something into the key functions that are used for for our memory management? Is it expensive? Well, I don't know, but we already do that. So one example is dev page map. and if you look at at the Put page, one of the functions that I refer to, which uses compound head, you see that there is a specific handling of demo pages. So the idea is that we need specific handling for mail pages and we'll be okay. So uh, we are not using the demo pages because uh, the unions in struct page overlap with a huge pages. So we have our own, our own solution. So as I said, we use two megabyte huge pages. And uh, the first tail, the tail page holds the U address, right? So that's the union uh, of the tail page, of the first tail page. Every struct page has a, a lots of unions, right? And the reference counting for the two megabytes are held 
in the head page, which is the first struct page of the array. And the first tail page holds some information, which we kind of found uh, room to add uh, one of, more of our metadata, right? So we added new address, namely we pr provide the user address for this two megabyte page. It allows us to translate kernel addresses to user addresses when we receive that. And we also added the LM order, which allows us to uh, do sub compounding. And we can take a two megabyte compound page and use it as a, a, a set of 16K or any other, uh, you know, by the order, a set of compound pages. Uh, this the, the address field allows us to know if the page is male or not, and that's how we uh, able to use uh, to, to modify the functions that we need get, put, and compile it. So the API, what the API does is 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 this: the init a huge page memory is is the key function. That's once you have memory segmentation implement in the kernel, it does the the rest of the magic, the creation of of mail for the user, right? So in this case, we do we create huge pages, right? The, the page count says what number, and then you get a huge page memory. This huge page memory can then uh, provide it to your uh, memory to, to your mail manager uh, in the kernel, where we create a memory translation table, right? You have a an eight byte entry, a pointer, per two megabytes, right? And you have to have per per each byte per each huge page rather than a an area of memory. Because while the virtual memory is contiguous, the physical is not, which is kind of uh, should be fixed. In my mind. And the second thing we do when we init huge page memory, we set the U address field, thus making these pages mail pages, and uh, uh, which will uh, which will use for I in the kernel, uh, make them return back to the user, allow them to return back to the user. And obviously, you need to allow uh, to create your custom memory management. And in this uh, case, we just created a simple limit list of 4K pages and 16K pages. Uh, one, one, one key is that the head page, that's the first page, is never used for IO because its reference counter is never zero or should not be uh, ever zero because it holds the actual reference counter for the two megabyte page, uh, huge page. The tail pages usually have reference card of zero. Well, they're in user space, but uh, because we're using them as separate pages in uh, in I/O, then we use their specific uh, preference card to make sure to, to manage their their ownership. So that's that's why get and put page operate on on the tail page pages rather than on head page. That's why compound uh, head needs to 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 say, oh, it's a mail page. I don't need the compound page. I need the actual page or whatever is uh, the compound page for this main page is right it's a special care now when we have this memory issue set up and we have the memory translation table, uh, table set up everything is just technicality right you create a socket so there are current sockets it's nothing new we create one and we uh, connect to the destination that's kind of it we return our internal uh, index for the socket to be used by the user. Next, we create a TCP ring a, a for sync IO. In this case, we provide the index and the cache. So the cache allows the you know the allocation of memory for the uh, shared ring. Right? And in the kernel, we, we affiliate the socket that we created earlier with the ring itself. And we create a kernel thread that actually does the sync IO for us. Again, nothing, nothing actually new here. But we are combining existing uh, solutions. Send buffer is is the easiest of them all. We just provide the index, the buffer, the length of the buffer, and a flag that tells us that allows us to know whether or not we have additional buffers be, be behind us. Well, we need to patch uh, the send so and to avoid the the system call of of waking up the the sender thread. So we just post a mail buffer on the string. And we just wake up the kernel thread. That's kind of that's kind of it. The user doesn't do much when sending. And then we have the async TX thread. It wakes up, it pulls the, the TX string, it does a translation, it looks up the 
a memory stone selection table, looks up the user address and send it to the kernel because obviously user addresses cannot be used for, for I.O. And then we send the, the buffer with the CP send page. Again, in this implementation, we do it uh, separately for each page. And it, it's kind of probably a point where we can optimize. So here we go to the to, to, to the question that, that of, uh, of uh, zero copy semantics. Who actually owns the send buffer? How do we solve the solution? How do we solve the question? When is the buffer yours to modify? Right. So as we said, we have reference uh, hand, uh, reference count handled by the get and page uh, functions, and when we send the packet, we page reference. Oh no, sorry. We get our we get page our page and increase its reference count, and then. Uh, well, when it's TCP finishes its send operation, it will get it down to zero. But again, it's not trivial because you have can have multiple sends on the send buffer, and so it's kind of a question. So one option is to use a socket notification, similar to what message zero copy does. So we have uBuff info in the SKB that can uh, allow us that can not use can be used to notify us of a completion. One thing you can do, opportunistic state management on the head page. Right? So on transition, on reference count transition from zero to one, from one to zero, we can actually use the IO page, the first 4K page, not, not the extract page, the, the 4K page itself, to hold some metadata because it's, it's, it's a page that is, will not be used for IO. So in this case, because we have 512 4K pages, we can, uh, stop, we can use eight bytes for each page on this head page and, and kind of set a flag that's it's now on TX, it's used by the kernel or used by the by the user. But they, obviously this is open, open to a, a to rest condition where the a, the last TX and the you know the last three overlap and you can get a, a wrong set. And what we actually did here is a system call to query the refer reference count of struct page so you can probably uh, you combine the two right when you see that the head state is user you can actually validate it with a system call right and you see when you see the state is kernel then you know probably something is uh, issued great yeah uh, now zero copy zero copy you provide an index and an i event which is an you know, address and then and your cache. Why do you provide your cache? Because you collect a scattergun list from the TCP socket. And you take out memory from the kernel. So in order to uh, disallow starvation, you need to uh, refill the kernel pages, right? On receive, we, we use U address uh, that we hid in, in the first tail page in order to translate the kernel addresses to user addresses and provide and fill up your array back and allow you to do whatever you need. So what is needed in the kernel? In kernel, you need to use SKB zero copy iteration stream, for example, uh, uh, which is using, for example, DCP ML. There is some version. Uh, it's not suitable for us because it has limitation like for K pages are only allowed and et cetera. I mean, it's something simpler, but the point is that there are uh, reference implementation that we can use and did. So we have the own function that collects uh, the buffers as as they are. On initialization, you need to create a mail implementation inside the kernel. So you need a mail allocator for the device driver to, uh, to allocate pages for, for the C for, uh, flow. So we use the magazine allocators, which I use and should you know, should be inside the kernel regardless of, of mail, because per uh, CD, per, per core uh, streams are, are you know, bad. And obviously driver modification like and not unlike a fixed DP where you know the driver allocates memory uh, for zero copy. And we have the same questions for or for, for, for the C buffer. So who owns it? Reference count, uh, counting handles the state, but you still have options like you have, can use the opportunistic state management, and you can use one buffer to receive, just like XDP does, and just transfer the ownership on X. 
and you know still like what happens on in mixed use uh, uh, you, you, mixed use page when you know one part is rx one part is cx so kind of so, so, you know so difficult questions which you know uh, with simple rules like uh, as i mentioned one uh, page per receive item can solve additionally what we did is we added a dbdk mayo pmd so why because it's hardware agnostic it uses standard Linux tools, and we can use hybrid use cases, like we can use decrypt in user space and send the plain text via the network stack. How? We just use add default Rx ring and direct SMIT, uh, just like packaging does. Instead of TCP, just uh, direct driver. They all use huge, huge pages, and they have their own memory management with, uh, above pools. So all of this is uh, will be available in GitHub. Uh, so next steps. Uh, we need to upstream everything to the links, to the TDK, and provide the user library, obviously. But it's my job, obviously. We can defer a survey with QMU, it's just another process, which can be a mail, mail aware. And if the guest is also mail aware, we can actually provide zero copy uh, in facility for guest processes, right? This is something that needs to be done. And in addition, we can try efficient copy semantics with Intel uh, single instruction multiple data, like SSA, and you know, actually do the copy uh, in user space where Mayo is your backend. Mayo, the, the, you know, the, the, the library copies in user space with vector optimizations and then does zero copy IO. Uh, so this is what I mentioned. And no, now we have six memory channels, so probably we can, it can be faster. So uh, there'll be GitHub. Uh, it's kind of was my plan to see, to put it on the slide. I will post it in the, the chat for 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 uh, on edit. So if you know any questions, uh, please do contact me or you know, ask them now for the you know, fifteen or thirteen minutes that we have now. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That was uh, fascinating. Uh, questions that have uh, not yet come up, please post them. Uh, while new questions are coming up, uh, Alex, I'll maybe start with one of my own. So uh, maybe an oversimplification. Basically, this improves message zero copy by not having to do the pinning and MMU operations minimally, right? By effectively allocating your own memory. And there have been other people, like NetGPU was something that Jonathan Lemon had, uh, presented last year at the same conference and in various other forums. Um, so it, it sounds like there may be more than one thread that is trying to do special memory allocations. And special memory allocations, which VMware is very aware of, but a lot of other people worry about, leads to stranding as the inverse effect, right? If you're going to allocate and hold them, then uh, that memory can't be used by somebody else. If you're not going to allocate, then you might temporarily end up underrunning some thread. Have you guys had any conversations or have, do you have any thoughts about how to balance that kind of memory management? Because that's sort of the secondary effect. Did the question make sense? Yes, so basically it's, uh, you have, for, for process like the ticket, what you, do IO extensive? You allocate, you pre-allocate your huge pages. That's kind of what you yeah. do, and it's a limitation in my mind. So I don't understand why, for most processes, two megabyte pages are not the default, right? And then for okay. small scripts, like you use, okay, that's a small script. It doesn't really need two megabytes. Just okay. Right? So uh, that said, let's say I fix that, right? So it's it's dynamic. If it's easy for me to allocate, I can do it dynamically, all right? So the user can obviously hold its memory, but it can you know, also free whatever it doesn't need. So there's nothing here that says, uh, it, it's some implementation details. There's nothing inherent here that says, this memory is blocked and will be, not be used for anything useful. Right, so, and it's all of your application memory, right? So in, in, in standard networking, you have the kernel memory and the memory itself, right? So you have like two blocks of memory that are separate, and you have overlap in in, in function. So when you use zero copy both on receive and entrance speed, you kind of uh, remove this overlap. And 
the memory that is used is only used by the application for something that presumably needs and for the eye itself. Right. The, the risk is temporal, right? The risk is I have like a thousand threads that start up. They all go and effectively the memory can't be uh, while you're transferring it, they have to be either pinned or somehow your MMU has to be restricted from allowing so that page to migrate around, right? And 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 you may end up with a pressure on the MMU. That's that's what I'm saying. So have you guys looked at mitigation strategies? Uh, it looks like you have a raised hand as well. Yes. Maybe. Uh, okay. So maybe just has the same question, and I don't want to take over the conference. So Jesse, go for it. Uh, it's just, uh, my question was just for, oh my God, my head is huge. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, what's the advantage of doing the new interfaces over fixing something that exists, right? Like There's AFXDP is very close to what you're already doing. It's just posting rings to host memory. So if you did it over AFXDP and it already supports pre-posting of buffers from user space, what's the difference? So the difference is the FXDP doesn't can't use the network stuff. So Sorry, FXDP, I couldn't hear. The F, FXDP can't use the network stuff. Right, so you post the packets and you bypass the network stuff and, and send it to the driver. And have, have you seen the API for FXDP? So you, you need to, to actually manage all the rings by yourself. So yeah, you do. The, yeah. The, the simple API is is uh, is kind of a bonus, but the main issue is a uh, it's a FXDP is a kernel bypass because because it's net network centric. They don't do changes in the memory management of what I could allow myself to do. Uh, and without doing these changes, you can't really make sure that the, the, the buffers that you send or you know receive are not mixed in with some kernel memory and you know you get a mess. Right, so yeah, I mean, AFXDP is a raw packet interface, right? Exactly. So um, I'm just wondering like if you can, I mean, did you, look at or try to figure out how you might be able to do this speed up transparently i mean i guess you really can't because you have to allocate the memory separately right so but but, but to, to your initial question so there is no limitation to uh, combining this uh, api that i'm proposing into afxdb or in standard socket library just i i implement something fast for my own you know implementation proof of concept all the other just again it's, it's the concept yeah i think it sounds like it's closer to message zero copy than anything else, right? So it might be easier yes. to have message zero copy with a pre-allocated buffer pool or a user supplied buffer pool because that maintains the semantics for everything else, but the buffer locations will change. So the, it's, someone mentioned the page pool. Again, the page pool, the, the driver would make sure that the page goes back to where it, where it belongs. It's not a kernel wide solution. Okay, thank you. Good. Any other questions? All right, here's one more. Uh, okay. I think AFXDP could be taught to send receive traffic to the stack with a different AFXDP flag. But I may so, be so again, over the, the same issue with AFXDP as, as was with, with NetMap, by the way. With NetMap is the same thing as AFXDP, just 10 years younger, older. Uh, you, you have to manage all your pages. You have to hunt them down because nothing guarantees that when you do a receive or something, you know, and someone frees the packet, frees the SKB for some reason. The memory doesn't go and and uh, get inserted into the kernel's memory management uh, infrastructure, and then you have user accessible pages in the memory. So that's why the kernel bypass is is is, is built in such a way. So you get the pages and, and you kind of hold them close with full pages and and, and etc. So you have to add the memory segmentation over it, where you are able to uh, do your receive, send, whatever it is freely so you allocate it uh, with a specific allocator but then it's free somewhere sometime and you don't need to worry about it help helps all 
Okay, any other questions? Going once, going twice. All right, in that case, thank you, Alex. Uh, thank looking you. forward to the patches, and I'm sure you'll be around in the lounge later for people who have yes. questions. We will end the session and uh, we will reconvene in uh, five minutes for the next one. See you then. Thank you.